My name is Richard Ritchie Greenberg and uh, I'm from Los Angeles, California. I went to Verde Valley School from uh, 1967 to 1971. I'm a four-year senior um, and I came from a very urban and uh, privileged environment and I went off to Sedona, Arizona where I was living in a lot of red dust with a lot of people who were unlike people I had ever met before. When I was in the fifth grade, the coolest guy in my elementary school decided that he was going to tra transfer out of our French class into a Spanish class. Uh, he was going to transfer out of our French class into a Spanish class. And I said to him, why are you doing that? And he said, well, because you have to speak Spanish to go to Verde Valley School. And I said, well, what's Verde Valley School? And he said, oh, it's this really cool place in Arizona where I go for summer camp every year, but I want to go there to, you know, go to school. So that sort of put the idea of Verde Valley School in my head and I came home and I mentioned it to my mom and in those days my mom wrote away for a brochure and uh, next thing you know we had a brochure and we were looking at Verde Valley School and as it turned out the friend who had told me about Verde Valley School didn't go to Verde Valley School although today he is the superintendent of schools in the city of Beverly Hills um, but I ended up going to Verde Valley I had not heard of any other prep schools I was not interested in any other prep schools it was just kinda like yeah Verde Valley sounds good my desire to go to Verde Valley was based on the fact that I had been the shortest guy in my elementary school and um, when uh, I had to be in a show I was in the very center of the front row because I was so puny and I decided that um, you know I didn't want to be picked on by all the people who were going to go to Beverly Hills High uh, that I thought I'd have fewer oppressors if I went to a smaller school so I ended up going to Verde Valley and thinking I was going to you know become a whole different non Richie Greenberg person but you know Rich Greenberg a very serious fellow uh, and it turns out that I remained Richie Greenberg and I got made of for being made fun of for being short but it was okay I uh, could overcome uh, five other oppressors instead of a whole huge school full so that's why I ended up going to Verde Valley was uh, I didn't want to be oppressed in a big public high school I had really no idea what to think of. Um, I, had, I had no expectations of Verde Valley School. Um, I was pretty much an urbanite. Even when I got to Verde Valley, I remained an urbanite. I wasn't a kid who was riding horses. I did a lot of hiking and climbing, and I enjoyed doing that. But I was just a babe in the woods. I was a 13-year-old, sheltered little Jewish kid from Beverly Hills, California, who had probably made his bed most of the time, but I'd, I'd never done my own laundry. I'd never had to take care of myself. And the first time I got to Verde Valley and I, I had a series of interviews and there was a sort of aggressive admissions uh, process, uh, I thought, wow, this place is cool. You know, I like it. I didn't consider that I was going away from home. I didn't consider anything. It was just sort of this evolving experience. Um, and ultimately I got in and that continued to evolve and we were packing and the next thing you knew I was in the school and the next thing you knew I was in a small little room in East Dorm and I had to figure out how, you know, like, oh, is it dinner time? Well, what does that mean? And take care of myself. And in those days, um, you know, we had group showers that uh, were, uh, everybody had to shower together basically and there was no privacy at all and it was a complete change but you know it was what it was so I didn't really think anything about it I just sort of survived it. <laughs> VVS first taught me how to be self-reliant, which I think was a very important lesson to learn at age 13. And it also taught me how to put up with people whose behavior I couldn't control. So I learned how to live with other people and I learned the complexities of living with other people. Um, I also, just from that community experience, which was one part of it, and then academically, you know, we were anthropologically oriented, and so um, I learned about other cultures, and I learned about ethnocentrism, and I learned to look at the world in a different way than perhaps I would have if I had gone to Beverly High. Well, for sure, uh, as I would have had I gone to Beverly High. Um, I learned 
trades. Uh, you know, I came home one uh, Christmas and I accidentally broke a window and I went to the hardware store, I bought a pane of glass, I stuck the pane of glass in the window and I glazed it myself and my mom came home and she said, who fixed the window? And I said, well, I fixed the window. And she said, well, where'd you learn to do that? And I said, well, Verde Valley. And she just said, well, I'm glad they're teaching you something there. Because, you know, from my parents' point of view, I was off at boarding school and they didn't know what was going on. But the fact is I was learning a whole lot more than what was written down in books. Um, do you feel lingering influence today? So, you know, it's kind of funny. Uh, I'm active in Verde Valley today. I'm on the board of directors and I have been for, I guess, five years or something. I'm not sure how long. There was a long period where I wasn't active with Verde Valley School and in fact I just sort of uh, I loved it. I embraced it. If you ask my friends where I went to high school, they'll all say, Verde Valley. So it's been a part of my life and it's inexorable. But the fact of the matter is, is that uh, more so today, I am involved with Verde Valley School because I believe it has returned to the culture and the values that it had when I was a student there. And I think we're searching for academic excellence. We're teaching our students to get along in the world. We're teaching our students to camp and to understand themselves. And I think that these are really important values that the school was able to impart and was able to impart to me. So when I saw the values realign with my own values, um, I was able to return to an active role with Verde Valley School. Um, how does it affect me every day in my life? Um, I have a sense of self-reliance. Um, you know, I, I told the story uh, the other day about the fact that when I was in college, because I had gone to Verde Valley School, I was far more self-sufficient than most college freshmen. And one of the things I would do when I was going out with a girl was I would say, why don't you come to my house? I'm gonna do my laundry and my apartment and, and so, I would do my laundry and I would take it out and I would fold it and this person would see that I had like totally nailed the self-sufficiency thing which made me unbelievably attractive to girls because hey I could do my own laundry so uh, I love doing laundry I continue to love doing laundry uh, I do a lot of work around the house trades that I've learned having to do with cement having to do with glass having to do with wood um, so you know I probably use tools from my Verde Valley toolbox all the time. So there are too many stories that I can tell you that were profound for me at Verde Valley School. Um, I can share with you that I was a 13-year-old Jewish boy from Beverly Hills, California who months later ended up living with a Hopi family that had no running water and no bathroom so you had to go to an outhouse in the back. Uh, in honor of my arrival the Hopi family slaughtered a cow in their living room. Um, basically I slept in a bed with my Hopi brother uh, and you know what I say to my children today when when they're in a situation that they can't believe they're in I say you know when I was living with the Hopi reservation on the Hopi reservation I basically closed my eyes at night and said well I don't know what today was about that was kind of cool I wonder what tomorrow is going to bring so you know experiential learning has been a very big part of my life and continues to be a big part of my life uh, and that was something I learned to sort of ride along with when I was a student at Verde Valley. Um, I went to Mexico, I lived with the family of a dentist. Uh, when I lived with the family of the dentist, I was 15 years old, I didn't have a driver's license in the United States, but my brother in Mexico let me drive the family Volkswagen. So I was driving the Volkswagen in Oaxaca, we got pulled over, the guy like said, let me handle this, and I was ready to pull out like my library card, which might look like a driver's license, he said, just let me handle this, and he gave the cops some money, and I was like, whoa. So I learned a little bit about that down in Mexico. My junior year I was part of the building of what is now called the Hobbit House but which is what we called the Dome. Uh, it is a structure based on uh, the way the architect Paolo Soleri uh, who built Arcosante which is nearby uh, structured his buildings and uh, 
We had a failed field trip that was supposed to go down to the creek and live as a community for field trip period, but the woman who owned the road to the creek wouldn't let us get there, so we decided, well, what are we going to do? Our leader, Jorgen Sorensen, said, let's build a Solari dome. So we mounted up the dirt and we put up the rebar and we poured concrete on it, and the concrete trucks fell in the dirt and couldn't get all the way up the hill, and we had to get wheelbarrows and move the concrete up to the dome, and the whole thing was an, an amazing learning experience. During the time that we were building the dome, the rifle range caught on fire, there were a bunch of stored mattresses there, it was next to a cinder block square in which all the school ammunition had been stored, so they've got this raging fire going next to this little ammo storage area. We had to put that out ourselves, there was no Sedona Fire Department, we had a fluorescent orange fire truck and a little crummy pump called, uh, what was it called, the auxiliary. and. Uh, so we as students had to put that fire out. And then my senior year on field trips, I went to the Deep South and I lived with the family of a, um, a civil rights lawyer in Greenville, Mississippi. So the experiences that I've had at Pretty Valley School are so remarkable, not even including sort of the friendships I developed, the people I know, um, just sort of the academic stuff. I learned to speak Spanish fluently at Verde Valley. Uh, my Spanish teacher at the time didn't speak English. His wife was the best dancer. She was the dance teacher. So the girls all hung out with the dance teacher in order to be near the girls. You had to hang out with the husband of the dance teacher who was Cecilio who didn't speak English. And so all the guys learned to speak Spanish and it became sort of a, a, a medal of pride that we could flip back, back and forth from English to Spanish. And that was all experiential. That wasn't stuff that we were learning in books. That was about this community and, and that's the way I learn. That's kind of the point, that the school adapted. I took everything out of that school that I could take out of that school and the good news is that it wasn't all in the books because that's not how I learn and that's what I've learned about myself. I'd be in a much bigger house. I would be an agent. You know, I would be working in show business in some crazy way. I don't know. Uh, you know, my mother used to say to me um, that um, she missed that I had missed me because I had been away at Verde Valley School, but that she thought I had gotten a really good education there. And um, I think I would have been different if I'd gone to Beverly High. You know, I married a girl who I've known since elementary school, um, but Verde Valley came in between. And if Verde Valley hadn't come in between, she wouldn't have paid two seconds worth of attention to me in high school. Uh, I had to have something that changed me and allowed me to grow in a way that when I finally ran into her in college, it was like, hey, he's a different kind of guy than what I'm used to. And I think that that was a very important factor in, in you know, why I ended up marrying this girl I've known since first grade. But that's sort of a full circle thing that happened despite the fact that I went to Verde Valley. And if I hadn't gone, it may never have happened because I would have been Richie Greenberg in high school. And you know, for whatever that's worth. There were some faculty members who I really loved. Um, there was a guy named Grady Hobson who was my dorm head who, if you didn't make your bed, when you came back from breakfast, your bed was made, and there was a small little slip of paper on your bed, and it said, I made your bed, Grady. If you didn't do your work job, any work job, sweep the hall, clean the toilets, although he didn't do the toilets much, but if, if you didn't sweep the hall, there was a note on your bed, I swept the hall. And that was, for me, you know, a, guilt was a great motivator. Jewish kid from Beverly Hills. And then, um, uh, you know, he was a phenomenal math teacher and I would sit and I would slave over a problem, I'd slave over a problem and I'd take it to him and I'd say, Grady, I've tried to work this out, I've shown you all my work, what's up? And he would just look at my problem and he would say, seven times six is not 54. And that was it, it was done. He, he always could find that. So he was a great influence. There was a headmaster when I started at Verde Valley named Neil Bull. Now a lot of people don't like Neil Bull because he spent money building a big house and people say negative things about him. But he brought to Verde Valley School Minnie Garwood, Peter Cunningham, Grady Hobson, uh, a set of instructors that were the best 
secondary school teachers, they had all come from the Robert College in Istanbul, and they really knew their stuff, and they were classy, and they figured it out, and they made it work. Um, and then also, uh, Cecilio Benitez, who I loved with my heart, was someone who was my Spanish teacher, but he was way beyond my Spanish teacher. Um, the best example of that being my senior year. I'd had a girl who I'd been flirting with my whole junior year and I was deeply in love with her. And my senior year we were in the same Spanish class with Cecilio and I was walking from class one day and I said, why do you think Diane always picks on me? And this was in Spanish, by the way. And he said to me, Ricky, because she's in love with you. And I was like, really? So. After Cecilio clued me to the fact that she was in love with me, I immediately went to, on a town trip and carried her groceries home for her, and that worked out really well. Um, other great faculty, um, Russell Fox, really great faculty member. Uh, Taught, we, we did music together and he just uh, was open and friendly and sweet and Ginny, his wife, they were just part of my life. You know, these are people who became part of my life. Peter Cunyholm was a hilarious guy. Uh, I lived in East Dorm and when it was time for us to get up in the morning, every day there was a different noise that he would come up with from a trumpet to a duck call to clang, you know, banging on the top of a trash can. Whatever it was, he made sure we were all up in time to go to breakfast and that was fairly hilarious. Um, so, you know, it, the list goes on. There was a nurse who would take us skiing in Flagstaff, Claire Kowalski, who we jokingly called Leadfoot because she drove up the road from the, the uh, infirmary to the campus at like incredibly high speed. And she was no spring chicken. Um, you know, uh, a lot of these people touched my lives in many ways. Sam Ferraro uh, the, was another guy named uh, Tom Parker, who was hilarious in his oddness. Um, it, the list goes on and on. They're just uh, people who influenced my life. Cliff Perkins, uh, Cliff and Maggie Perkins. I was a stagehand for Maggie. I was the technical theater guy. I love that light board. I love doing the spotlight. I used to... Um, we had these visiting artists one year who were laser specialists. They were these two guys who had invented holography. And their names were Gordon Thorne and Lloyd somebody. And they set up this huge holograph uh, lab in the barn. And they built a huge um, sandbox that sat on aircraft tires, inner tubes, so that it wouldn't shake with the earth because the earth had a natural shake to it. And that was how they could get the, the images still enough to record a hologram. But one of the byproducts of that was that they used a little red laser. So we all got to play with these lasers. And one of the things I did with the laser was I took a, a balloon and I stretched it across a like a round thing that you, uh, uh, let's say a piece of glass or something and put a little piece of mirror in the dead center of it and I would aim the laser at it and then I would play music and it would project a sine wave or it would project the music on the back of the, the theater screen in Brady Hall. So I got um, a tone generator that would create a specific tone like and that would create a sine wave, and a sine wave looks pretty cool when it's a pure sine wave, and I could project the sine wave on the back of the theater. So the girls who were dancers were saying like, ooh, can you give me a certain sine wave? Let's look at some. And so again, I was using this laser to project these things on the back of Brady Hall because we had these visiting artists who were crazy mad scientists, and ultimately we, I did experiments with them about 3D filmmaking. Uh, when we were seniors uh, on Ditch Day, we used the laser to help the juniors find their rings um, and the only way that they could see the beam was that they had to throw dirt in the air because the beam was so fine that it only showed up when there was dust in it so we thought that was pretty funny and kind of a little payback um, so you know so much went on at Verde Valley School for me that it's uh, there were a number of remarkable experiences I was in the class that uh, ended up doing the fire run but changing the name. 
Um, when we were students, we called the fire run a yebache, which was something that we had inherited from classes before us. And then we had uh, a Navajo student among us whose name was Jasper Joe, and he explained to us that a yebache was a very specific ritual and that, you know, by commandeering its name, we weren't doing his people any good. So uh, ultimately we changed, or the name was changed to a fire run. But we used to begin the fire run in the notch on Napoleon uh, with torches that were dipped, we had sh torn up sheets wrapped around the top and then bailing wire around those and we'd dip them in kerosene and we'd light them at the top of Napoleon and then we would literally run down Napoleon in a single file line carrying these torches. And then behind Brady Hall in the parking lot there would be an effigy of Moby Dick or Hester Prynne, some big project that we had completed as seniors. And we would throw the torches onto the effigy and into this big bonfire and we would start this enormous bonfire. And then everybody would just keep running around the bonfire and clapping and singing and being idiots. Um, pretty much for a couple of hours and then it would die down and then the particularly moronic students would start to try and jump over it and that was always moronic. Um, but that happened. So that was just part of the ritual. Um, the fire truck was always pulled up to the bonfire so we had it parked nearby in case things got out of hand. Um, and I was like the head of the fire crew my senior year which made me be a very serious person about that kind of stuff. But nonetheless, well, I was never going to be a guy who jumped the fire. But, um, you know, uh, fire crew was a big thing and uh, that's, that's how I saw that was a risk to have a big fire there. It's not on campus. Okay. The creek. You know, I, we used to go down to Big Rock and swim at the creek and my, f well, I have to tell you my favorite place uh, aside from the creek, which is there was a mechanic at Verde Valley School whose name was Harold Stein. And I probably spent every afternoon with Harold Stein in the compound. And he would be overhauling trucks and fixing things. And I would go in there with him and I would just spend the entire afternoon handing him tools, learning how cars worked. I was like a greaser. Um, and that was, you know, you'll notice I'm not talking about studying a lot. I'm not talking about all the time I spent in the library. Um, I spent my time, I spent a lot of time with Harold Stein in the compound uh, working on vehicles. So that was kind of crazy. Um, and then there were, you know, there were some, I'd say the creek. I liked the creek. I loved climbing to the top of Napoleon and just sitting there in the notch and having the wind blow and look at the campus. Um, my favorite places, I don't know if I can talk about that. <laughs>